Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants will be on a listen-only mode until the question and answer portion. If at that time you would like to ask a question, to press star 1. Today's conference is also being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. And now I'll turn the call over to your host, to Linda Lee. Ma'am, you may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Lee, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the Exploring Census Data webinar series. For anyone who may not be familiar with our format, the Exploring Census Data webinar series is a set of webinars presented on a monthly basis based on popular topics. The webinars are presented by our subject matter experts with the opportunity for Q&A at the end of each session. All webinars and Q&A sessions are recorded and will be accessible from the Census Academy's webinar tab once the recording and transcript are available. Today's webinar on education statistics is the third in our series for this year. This is our third installment of the series. We have all of the webinars from our previous series archived on census.gov, or you can also access them using the link provided on this slide. In light of the recent transition to 100% telework, we are utilizing technology offsite to continue operations. We aim to minimize interruptions as much as possible, and we appreciate your patience if we experience any technical delays. Please utilize the chat feature to notify us of issues should any arise, and we will do our best to address and mitigate them. Also, please note, today we will be focusing on data you can obtain from the Census Bureau related to education. We want you to be aware of all census products and programs on this topic. The webinar will not focus on additional topics such as hiring for the 2020 Census or our partnership programs. If you need additional information on any topic pertaining to the 2020 Census, please visit the 2020 resource site on census.gov. Today's webinar will be presented by Ms. Erlene Dowell and Ms. Amanda Klimek. Ms. Dowell is a program analyst with our outreach program specializing in the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program. Ms. Klimek is a statistician with our demographic program, the American Community Survey. So our first objective for today is to provide you with information on the types of data you can obtain related to educational services sector, also known as NAICS 61 in the North American Industry Classification System. And in a moment, we will provide a brief overview of the system for anyone who may not be familiar with how we classify. And knowing about the availability is powerful. Accessing the data itself can sometimes be a challenge. So our second objective is to show you how to get the data and we've included a section towards the end to help you find what you need. In today's webinar, we will go over a high-level overview about the Census Bureau and the structure of our programs. Then we will dive into the data from our programs with education statistics, so you can see the type of data that you can obtain. So from our programs, we will be covering the post-secondary employment outcomes, job-to-job -job flows, longitudinal employer household dynamics, and the American Community Survey. After showing you the data, we will go into how to access our data and then close out with a Q&A section. So let's go into about the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau is the federal government's largest statistical agency. We conduct over 130 surveys each year with our well-known surveys listed here. Collecting data on the nation's people is the decennial census, which takes place every 10 years. As you know, the 2020 census is going on right now. Please remember to respond because your response is critically important. At the end of the webinar, we've included contact information in case you may have questions on the 2020 decennial. Next, the American Community Survey is a program that collects demographic data annually. And in a moment, Amanda will dive into more details about this program. For business statistics, the Economic Census is our most comprehensive program, taking place every five years in the years ending in two and seven. We also have the Census of Government, which is the public counterpart of the economic census. A pyramid is a good illustration of the relationship between the time and details from our business or economic programs. We primarily conduct monthly, quarterly, and annual surveys. Now, in looking at this pyramid, it's important to know that the more current the data, the less amount of details, with more details available from programs categorized in the middle and bottom of the pyramid. With that being said, the Economic Census is a periodic survey that takes place every five years. It is illustrated at the bottom of the pyramid because it is the most comprehensive program when you're looking for business data. And as you move up the pyramid to our annual programs, 
you will find that you can use these statistics for analyzing trends. And finally, at the very top of the pyramid from monthly and quarterly programs is where you can obtain timely data. And before I turn the presentation over to our presenters, here are some key terms and items that are helpful to know when you use our data. First is the North American Industry Classification System, also commonly referred to as the NAICS. The NAICS is a system that we use to classify every business in the United States and is the primary dimension of business employment data that you'll see today. Each physical business location is assigned its own six-digit NAICS code based on the primary business activities at that location. Each, individ each individual business data are then turned into the summary statistics that we publish by industry and geography. In the reference section, we've included slides that illustrate the system. And if you'd like more information beyond the reference material, please visit our site, census.gov, where you will be able to access additional materials. Next is the term establishments as opposed to company or firm. Most of our employment data is collected and published on an establishment level. Collecting the data this way allows us to provide the most accurate picture in terms of business activity. For instance, if a company has both a manufacturing and retail locations in many states, separate data is captured for each location and not the company as a whole. If we didn't collect data this way, we would lose the accuracy and geographic and industry detail. Third, we collect data from both employer and non-employer establishments. Some programs only cover employer businesses while others cover both. Employers are businesses that have at least one paid employee, while non-employer businesses have no paid employee. Depending on the industry you're looking at, the non-employer statistics could represent a big portion of the sector. So it's good to be aware of this distinction. And finally, we are bound by Title 13 and 26 to uphold and protect privacy. As a result, we are able to provide high quality data because respondents are more likely to provide information knowing that their privacy will be protected. And now it's time for me to turn over the webinar to our presenter, Ms. Erlene Dowell. Thank you, Linda. As Linda mentioned, my name is Erlene Dowell, and I'm a program analyst for the U.S. Census Bureau, specializing in the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program. I'm excited to be spending the afternoon with you and sharing information about the Census Bureau and education. When I hear the word education, I automatically think of teachers and students. In census data, we can look at teachers in the education workforce or student enrollment. Census has data on educational attainment, educational enrollment, public school system and finances, teaching about statistics in schools, and the educational service, NAICS Code 61. Educational attainment covers the highest level of education that an individual has completed. Sources for this data come from the American Community Survey and Decennial. Educational enrollment covers enrollment in elementary, high school, colleges, or professional schools. Public school system and finances includes revenue, expenditures, and debt of elementary and secondary schools, Information on this topic comes from the Annual Survey of School System Finances, which is our survey spotlight for this webinar. Teaching about statistics using statistics in schools supports the efforts that every child is counted in the 2020 Census and how the count impacts federal funding. My colleague Adam Grundy recently wrote an article in the America Counts on class activities from the Census Bureau statistics in schools on Pinterest. I've included the link to the America Counts page for you to check out this article. Finally, Census covers educational services, which falls under NAICS Code 61, included in the 2017 Economic Census. Educational services covers more than elementary and secondary schools. It covers colleges, business schools, computer training, and flight schools, to name a few. For this webinar, we will highlight educational attainment, educational enrollment, public school systems and finances, and touch a little on NAIC 61 educational services. First, I will be covering education and the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics, or LEHD, program. The LEHD program has many areas that highlight educational attainment in all of their data sets, which we will go over. But there is one data set that strictly covers post-secondary employ employment outcomes. 
I'll be going over all of those areas in my presentation. Unlike the American Community Survey and the Economic Census, the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program is not dependent on survey responders. LEHD is a unique link between employer and employee data for the U.S. Of course, you cannot talk about LEHD without talking about the, LE, the Local Employment Dynamics, or LED, which is a voluntary federal-state partnership developed in 1990. Under the partnership, states send their unemployment insurance, or UI, wage records, and their quarterly census of employment wage data, or QCEW, to us, which then is combined with censuses and surveys to create new dynamic information on workers to produce public use data products as well as microdata for research. The UI records gives us jobs data, the QCEW gives us firm data, and our person data comes from censuses and surveys. Currently, LEHD has five different data sets with seven applications for easy access to these data sets. Each data set along with each data tool is unique in its own way. If you are curious about employment, hires, separations, turnovers, and earnings, you would look at the Quarterly Workforce Indicators, or QWI, utilizing the QWI Explorer or the LED Extraction Tool. If you want to look at statistics on job mobility across state boundaries or industries or earning changes due to job changes, you would use our job-to-job -job or J2J flows data using the J2J Explorer. If you want to look at employment for detailed and customized geography, you would look at the LEHD Origin Destination Employee Statistics or LOADS data using the On the Map or On the Map for Emergency Management data tools. One of our newer data sets is the Post-Secondary Employment Outcomes or PSEO. This experimental data set reports earnings by institution, degree field, degree level, and graduation cohort for one, five, and 10 years after graduation and is accessible through the PSEO Explorer. The current release includes the University of Texas system, public institutions in Colorado, University of Michigan, and University of Wisconsin-Madison. Future releases, as early as the end of the summer, will include more post-secondary institutions from the states of Ohio and New York's CUNY and SUNY. We are currently in discussion with State Council for Higher Education for Virginia, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, Arizona Board of Regents, Indiana Commission of Higher Education, and Utah System of Higher Education. Finally, we just released a new data set Veteran Employment Outcomes, or VEO. This new experimental data set reports earnings and employment outcomes for U.S. Army veterans one, five, and 10 years after discharge by military occupation, rank, demographics, industry, and geography of employment. This is also accessible through our VEO Explorer. Last year, the University of Michigan published an article that highlighted professional services and healthcare as their leading industries of graduates 10 years after receiving a bachelor's degree. The article looked at alumni employment and geographical statistics using the PSEO data from 2001 to 2015. The top industries of their graduates who received bachelor's degrees across all fields for employment after 10 years were professional scientific and technical services, healthcare and social assistance, educational services, finance and insurance, and manufacturing. CSEO is an experimental tabulation that highlights employment and earnings outcomes for college and university graduates. By matching university transcript data with a national database of jobs, PSEO provides annual earnings of the graduates in the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile and traces graduate movements from post-secondary institution, degree level, and degree major to employment by industry and geographic labor markets. Transcript data is provided to the Census Bureau by higher education systems and individual college and universities 
through data sharing agreements with the Census Bureau. In the article, an example about English ma majors from the University of Michigan's top industries are education, professional, scientific, and technical services, information, and healthcare and social assistance. This example mirrors the article. The article also mentioned how many graduates stayed in Michigan and how others left and where they went. This bipartite chart from the PSEO Explorer gives you a data visualization of the article. So let's go live, and I'll show you how easy this is. So if I just go to lehd.ces.census.gov, it'll take us to the LEHD homepage. And then I can just click on PSEO Explorer on the left-hand side, and it automatically takes me to the PSEO Explorer. So here, what I need to do is go ahead and change the data types to flow. I'm going to change the state to Michigan. We're going to keep it at baccalaureate and all cohorts. And then I'm going to change the destination flows and hit this earth or globe, and then change it to 10 years. So then I will scroll down to the bottom and continue by putting in percentage. And then I will clear the selection and click on English language and literature. So here you can see um, that under the program, we selected English language and uh, literature. We can see under the industry that Educational services is 26%, and professional, scientific, and technical services is 25%, and healthcare and social assistance and information are both 10%. And then you can see also um, under geography that 29% of those that have a bachelor's degree after 10 years um, stayed in Michigan, about 29%. And then 19% went to the east, north, central region. 17% um, went to the middle Atlantic. And then about 13% went to the Pacific uh, region. So one more thing that I wanted to show you. Um, if I go ahead and click on bar, the bar chart in the left-hand corner, now we can see what the outcome, the earnings outcomes are. And you can see under the English language and literature that after 10 years, their earnings are 64,959. And then it also gave us rhetoric and composition writing studies where the, um, after 10 years, the earnings were 65,238. And so that's for a bachelor's degree. But if we wanted to go and look at um, a doctoral degree, and I, I also click professional practice, you can see that it actually changes the program because most likely the, um, this is the program that they are offering at the University of Michigan. And so it changed it to law and medicine. So now we can see those with the bachelor's, I mean with a, math, a doctorate degree and law earns about 155929 after 10 years, while in medicine, it's about 250302 As for the rest of the data set, educational attainment can be crossed with race, earnings, age, industry, geography, and sex, to name a few. Educational attainment can be broken down into five groups. We have no high school diploma or GED, high school diploma with no college, some college or two-year degree, bachelor's or advanced, and other, which includes workers 24 or younger who are still going through college or those who have put college on hold or those who are undecided. Here's an example of our job-to-job -job flows, piggybacking on the University of Michigan article. This is a chart of those who left Michigan and what states they went to and what industries they went into. So here we can see that 24.5% went into Florida, 
28.4% went into Illinois, 19.8% went to Indiana, and 27.5% went to Ohio. The industries they were, went into were information, finance and insurance, professional, scientific and technical services, educational services, and healthcare and social assistance. Still looking at hires from Michigan, here's an example of educational attainment and top industries. You can see those with bachelor's degrees are predominantly in professional, scientific, and technical services, healthcare, and educational services. Finally, for J to J, we can see job flows from Michigan to the top four states and their educational level. We can see that majority of those who left Michigan had some college or a bachelor's degree or higher. Another one of our data tools is the on the map. Here's a snapshot of where people with bachelor's degrees are or advanced on the map actually where they work. So here's a snapshot of where people with bachelor's degrees and above work in DC. When I click on the blue underlying text of bachelor's degrees or advanced, the map updates to only those workers that work in DC with a bachelor's degree and above. The total workers equals 139,448. This final LEHD example using the QWI Explorer and one that I can relate to since that's my home state uh, is in the state of Hawaii. Accommodations and food services is the highest industry in Hawaii. Those with some college or associate's degrees make only $153 less a month than someone with bachelor's degrees or advanced. Those with some college or associate's degrees earn $3,395 a month, while those with bachelor's degree, degrees and above earn $3,548 a month. So that was a quick overview of the LEHD data tools highlighting educational attainment. Please visit the LEHD homepage at lehd.ces.com census.gov to check out some of these data tools. Okay, so changing gears, as Linda mentioned earlier, the economic census is conducted every five years on every employer businesses in the U.S. There are about 8 million employer businesses and data first, and data first started to be released back in September of 2019. The economic census is the most detailed and comprehensive economic program. It covers almost every two through six digit NAICS code covered by the Census Bureau. A link of a full list of exclusions is provided. One exclusion is that we do not publish data for agriculture, which is published by the Department of Agriculture since 1997. The economic census also provides detailed geographic information at the national, state, metropolitan area, and even county levels. We are publishing place levels for some sectors, but there have been some adjustments to publishing place level for manufacturing. The economic census also publishes other dimensions of data broken out by business size. There are four different dimensions that are available. Employment size, revenue size, total number of establishment, and by company size. We also publish data by franchise or non-franchise owners. What makes the economic census so detailed is that it includes over 200 data variables, such as number of establishments, employment totals, or payroll. Also, one unique aspect of data published by the economic census is revenue broken down below the national level. Here is a sample of the 2017 Economic Census Geography Release for Educational Services, NAICS 61 at six-digit code of all establishments for the state of Colorado. We can see number of firms and establishments, sales and revenues, and number of employees for both the professional and marketing training and fine arts school sectors. 
Just a reminder, these are only two of many educational services covered. Census developed this great infographic as a resource that shows you the states that have been released. Each state is represented by a hexagon, and when the data is released, the inside of the hexagon is shaded peach. Go to the link below to check out this graphic. Census has many new things going on for the 2017 Economic Census, starting with the geographic areas. Every other Tuesday, Census conducts a gas release webinar on geographical area statistics. Be sure to tune in on June 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when we present geographical area releases for Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. In those webinars, we also go over some of the NAICS changes, which include mining, manufacturing, retail trade, information, real estate and rental and leasing, and professional scientific and technical services. As part of the 2017 Economic Census, the new North American Product Classification System, or NAEP, will take the place of the product line. Under this new classification system, products are now going to be published consistently across their different sector. This will allow users to easily combine product data across industries. Other changes include new disclosure rules, and of course, the new data.census.gov dissemination platform. With the 2017 Economic Census, we are also releasing some fun facts on social media and other platforms. Each state is represented by the state's quarter and gives information about a sector for that state, like the example we have here for Virginia reported revenue of $2.4 billion for educational establishments. Data first started to be released back in September of 2019 with the first look estimates that provided national level estimates at the two through six digit NAICS code, and we will release the last data product, as you can see on the screen, around September 2021. Now I'd like to take this time to highlight one of our many economic surveys, the Annual Survey of School System Finances. This annual survey of elementary and secondary public school system finances begins six months after the fiscal year begins and continues for the next nine months. Data include revenue, expenditures, debt, assets, and characteristics. Statistics from for FY 2017 reveal the amount spent per pupil in all 50 states and D.C. increased by 3.7% to $12,201 per pupil during the 2017 fiscal year compared to $11,763 per pupil in 2016. Go to the link listed here for more information. Just a little more background on the annual survey of school system finances. Before 1977, expenditure data for school systems were included in the annual government finance survey. And though it is released every year, it is still included in the annual government finance survey every year ending with two or seven. Unlike other data, this data is public and not subject to confidentiality. Some major uses include allocation of federal funds, legislative research, wage and salary negotiations, and comparative studies of school finances across the country. With that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Amanda Klimek. Thank you, Erlene, and good afternoon. My name is Amanda Klemek, and I work with the American Community Survey Office's Outreach and Education Branch, and I'm here to talk about how we can use the American Community Survey, or ACS, to view education data. The American Community Survey, or ACS, is the nation's most current, reliable, and accessible data source for local statistics on critical planning topics such as age, children, veterans, commuting, education, income, and employment. The survey samples approximately 3.5 million addresses 
every year, and these data are collected continuously throughout the year to produce annual social, economic, housing, and demographic estimates. The ACS is also used to distribute more than $675 billion of federal government spending each year. These estimates cover more than 40 topics and support more than 300 known federal uses and countless non-federal uses. Businesses and communities use these estimates to make vital decisions, including where to locate hospitals and schools, what transportation needs exist, and what goods and services businesses should provide to the customers. We release three different sets of estimates each year, which are listed on this slide. We have the one-year estimates, which are collected over one calendar year, and include geographies with populations above 65,000. We have the one-year supplemental estimates, which are supplemental estimates to the one year based on the most popular tables. And these are included for geographies with populations above 20,000. And then there's the five-year estimates, which are collected over a period of 60 months or five years and include more granular levels of geography, such as census tracts and block groups. The ACS is such a great resource for education since we provide so many topics at so many geographic levels, including counties and school districts. Uh, if you look at the blue bar on the right, I've included some real estimates from our 2014 to 2018 five-year data. And this is just a sample of some of the uh, popular estimates that you can get from a selection of education topics on the ACS. The content collected by the ACS can be grouped into these four main types of characteristics that you see on the screen, social, economic, housing, and demographic. And you can see some of the social characteristics listed on the left, including popular topics such as disability and educational attainment. And the ACS also collects based demographic estimates, uh, characteristics such as age, Hispanic origin, race, relationship, and sex. And you might recognize that this is the same information collected on the decennial census that happens every 10 years. And if you go over, if you, if you go right under that, you will go to economic characteristics, which shows income, employment status, and some of the others you see here. And housing characteristics listed on the right includes both the physical and financial characteristics of housing, such as the year built and home value. Each question on the ACS is required for federal and state government programs. We provide a resource on the ACS website called the Why We Ask page, which gives the public information on the required use cases for these questions as well as how they appear on the questionnaire. And sometimes this information will, is useful in determining the types of data that you can find. And we'll actually explore this page briefly when we go over a demonstration of how to find this data. So out of all these topics, I've highlighted just a few that would be relevant for education right off the bat, such as educational attainment, school enrollment, and industry and occupation. But this is by no means an exhaustive list of the types of data that you can get that's relevant to education. And also, the data can be much more useful when you mix these topics with other topics in the ACS, such as educa educational attainment and age or or industry and occupation and race. And I'll show you uh, some of the various ways we have of creating all these different layers of data. Here you can see the different levels of geography that we offer. The ACS provides data for more geographies on an annual basis than any other household survey. And the great thing about this slide is that we can see how the different levels of geography interact with one another. This is helpful if you'd like to combine these geographies to approximate uh, some sort of area in your community that you're interested in, such as a neighborhood or uh, some sort of other uh, dis uh, municipal district or region. Lower geographic areas fit neatly within the larger areas connected with lines. For example, congressional districts, school districts, and places, which you will know as cities, towns, and other municipalities, fit neatly within states and don't cross state boundaries. But these may cross boundaries of other counties or metropolitan areas since they're not directly connected to counties. And I want to give you a quick little primer on census tract and block groups. Some of you might be familiar with these, but some of you might be new to the concept. So census tracts are small statistical subdivisions within a county with populations of 1,200 to 8,000 people. Think 
small towns, rural areas, and neighborhoods. And block groups are groups of blocks within a census tract with around 600 to 3,000 people, as you see blown out in the right corner of the screen. And we really like to encourage people to use these types of geographies as building blocks for any custom use that they might need. So here we have an example of one of our data profiles, which gives us a demographic breakdown of the population within Ann Arbor Public Schools, in keeping with the, the Michigan theme today. This table is one of our published products and can be found on data.census.gov. And I will give an example of how to find this in just a moment. We cater to a variety of data users with unique needs, so we have a variety of data access tools. This is a list of just a few of these tools, and a couple of these, such as on the map, uh, early mentioned earlier. These can all be found by navigating to census.gov, and then going to Explore Data, and then Data Tools and Apps. The Census Bureau's primary dissemination platform is data.census.gov. So we're going to briefly go through a demo of this platform right now to find some of the data that I've mentioned to you today. So here we see the front page of data.census.gov, and this is where we can start to explore our data as it likes to show us in the top here. So we are going to start with the advanced search. This is one of my preferred ways of looking at data. So we're going to start here because you can search by different topics, geographies, years, surveys, and if you're familiar with different types of codes, such as industry codes, you can search by that. But right now we're just going to fo focus on topics. Just assuming, you know, we're going into this tool with fresh eyes and we just want to see what they have on education. And so if we go into education, we can see a couple of various education-related topics. You can see educational attainment. If you see school, uh, click on school enrollment, you can see a couple things related to that. But if I just click on the broad category of education, it will bring up all of these options. And so I will go ahead and click on education and see what that brings up. And this brings up a couple of interesting tables right off the bat here. So we have a couple of subject tables here, which are tables that provide counts and percentages for, for estimates for some of the most popular topics and provide a cross-section, a cross-tabulation of several really useful topics for these. So we'll start with this educational attainment table. And this is uh, where I actually got the educational attainment estimates that I listed on the various quiz. 25 years with a that was a one year if change can be split. Scroll down a little bit. But it's very helpful provide a lot of different information. Probably a lot of from this one table, but feel feel person the real that more details down later. we have Google and show and different categories. Um, you know, you can go in the most and once you've found that, you can click on customize table, add different geographies. Um, I'll show you how to do that here in a moment with data profiles. You can add these um, and you can build data here. Show you how to find the data profile that I showed in the slide for the school district. He's not a, demo, a basic demographic socioeconomic breakdown of jobs in case we're going to do a school district. So surveys. And we're going to see this one year estimates data profiles. And that's how we're going to find the data profiles here. And we can add in a geography before we go to the customized table filter. Um, it's really up to whether you want to do it now or once you get to the table. And go in, and we're going to go into Unified School District. 
we're going to stick with Michigan. That's been working for us so far. I'm going to select Airport School. Unfortunately, it's there in the top. Search. And here we have some really neat data profiles for animals. So you can some, this is how you can get some interesting uh, demographics of economic about the school district. Um, we have a demographic breakdown on our first table. This is just basically, yeah, the basic demographic breakdown, age, race, uh, citizen voting age. Um, we have a table of social characteristics, which will give you, you know, um, educational attainment, relationship, marital status. Children um, living um, in the um, industry. And we have housing characteristics, which I mentioned earlier, describes both the physical condition of the housing stock, um, you know, the number of units and structure, the year the structure was built, and there's also some financial characteristics of the housing in the area, such as the home values and uh, gross rent and um, information like that. And there is just one more um, area I want to show you. And this is where I got the, the, that quick little estimate about the number of, um, the, the estimate of preschool and kindergarten teachers. And I got that here. I just, there, we, have so many, we have so many occupation tables. If you, you can go into the advanced search and you know, do topics and industry and occupation like I did earlier. But you can also just search on the front page. I'm going to type in, I like this detailed occupation table, um, this B24114. And this, just, this is a nation, uh, a nation level table, but it gives you such a great breakdown um, of all of these different occupations. And this is where I can find the breakdown of different education. Let's see, it's a little farther down. Yeah, here, see, I got this preschool and kindergarten teachers here, post-secondary teachers, elementary and middle school teachers. And again, you can get this information, um, you can get occupation information below the, um, the nation level. Um, this, is, this particular table is at the nation level. But if you go into that industry and occupation filter, um, that will give you tables that you can find at the other levels of geography that I mentioned. Um, and I want to go quickly to the why we ask, uh, why we ask page. So as I said earlier, this page mentions, um, gives information on, you know, what uses, uh, what statutory or otherwise uses these topics have for the questions that we ask on the ACS and the data that's presented using these topics. And I want to go back down to the let's see, industry, occupation, class of worker. Um, something that makes us different from um, the, the household survey is different from the economic surveys, kind of like Erlene mentioned earlier. She was showing a graphic on where, um, you know, where people with bachelor's degrees work in DC. Um, these, these household surveys, such as the ECS, are based on where people live. So um, you're going to get you're, you're going to get this information um, of like occupation and you know educational attainment everything based on where people live, and um, something interesting that happens in the education field is the way this question is asked on the ACS um, is if this person had more than one job, describe the one at which the, uh, the most hours were worked. So we will only take we we will only um, show you know the the primary job someone had, which is based on the number of hours. So that is also an interesting consideration um, when you consider, you know, the education factor. We're going to go back to our PowerPoint here. And I showed you some of the, um, you know, some of the really useful pre-tabulated data that we have. And we have quite a lot. And we have, you know, quite a few different variations of how the data is presented. You know, we have cross-tabulations of income and race and educational attainment. Um, all, a lot of these categories are already, you know, pre-tabulated for you in various combinations. But it's possible that there's, you know, there's something that you're looking for that you can't find in our pre-tabulated data. And um, we also produce a product called the Public Use Microdata Sample, or PUMS, 
which is a powerful microdata set that allows you to create your own custom tabulations in case you can't find what you need in those pre-published tables that I presented a moment ago. And this is a brief example of what makes it different from the summary data, data that you might see in data.census.gov or other sources. In these summary tables, such as the one much like data.census.gov, individual records are categorized and weighted to create a larger population. So this example at the census have taken living in Michigan who indicated that they were a male between the ages of 25 to 34 who had graduated high school or beyond, and they grouped them together and weighted them to create an estimate of all the males in Michigan who fit this educational attainment category. And these statisticians have also calculated and provided the margin of error for this estimate, which you can see on the right. By contrast, the microdata shown below provides a sample of those records that the statisticians used. And here you can see that one person who responded to the ACS in Michigan is a 34-year-old male who is a high school graduate. In order to create an estimate, the data user must take this raw data and follow the same steps that the statisticians did in the example above. However, we have some tools that do make it quite a bit easier than, you know, being a, trying, trying to create a, you know, a professional table. We have some tools that will create this table for you. If you're interested in an example of how PUMS can be used in action, you can visit an interactive data visualization that we released last year on young adults in higher education. And I'm going to go actually navigate over to this right now. So we use the PUMS rather than our internal microdata to showcase the sophistication of what can be done using the PUMS. And we created a really interesting story on what degrees young adults are getting and what those degrees are doing for them in terms of occupation and earnings. And this is not an analysis that could have been conducted using only our existing tables. And so, you know, we have the story of, of um, you know, how many young adults have a bachelor's degree? What are the most common degrees for men and women? You can hover over it, um, learn a little more. And what occupations do young adults get with their degrees? Um, just to remind you, again, this is based on where people live. Um, so, um, and do young adults get what they paid for? So it's a, you know, it's a breakdown of um, median earnings um, and, um, you know, bachelor's versus high school and graduate versus uh, bachelor's degree. And so I just really wanted to emphasize this is, this is publicly available data that we use. This is not our, you know, internal microdata that we use ourselves. So this is something that, you know, a data user um, external of the Census Bureau could, could produce. Um, so that's what we really wanted to emphasize what's available and not not necessarily what um, a you know census bureau um, with high level access to our internal data um, could do on their own. Um, if you're interested in this uh, microdata and like, would like to learn more, we just had an informative webinar on Tom's data a couple months ago on March 11th, and this also included a demonstration of the new microdata access tool I was referring to that allows you to create these custom tables. So you can find the recorded webinar and the associated transcript on Census Academy's recorded webinars page, which is linked on this slide. And it was pretty recent, so you can um, go to yeah, you can go to Census Academy and um, just look for the look at the recent recorded webinars, and it should be it should be on there pretty recently. So there's a couple of considerations when working with ACS data as opposed to economic data used throughout the rest of this webinar. And the first, which I've emphasized a couple times, which is that this is a household survey based on demographics and not one provided by businesses. So as far as employment records go, this allows us to capture all types of workers included under employer businesses, including you know, self-employed, um, government, employer businesses, um, you know, different, it's, it's, it's different than you know, payroll records and um, government records and it's, in that it's, it's all encompassing and you know it, it's, it allows people to identify themselves not businesses to identify their employees so you know the data sources can be used uh, you know in conjunction with one another to get really a complete picture um, 
most tables are based on where someone lives, not necessarily where they work or go to school. And you have the choice between one or five year estimates, which can yield different types of estimates depending on your data needs. Finally, we use occupation codes specific to the Census Bureau and not NAICS codes. Um, so if, you'd, you know, if you want to look more into these, uh, these codes that we use, um, you, can, uh, take a look at, you can take a look at our website, census.gov slash ACS, for more information. And finally, you can sign up for and manage alerts on ACS news and events such as conferences and webinars via Gov Delivery. Visit our website or connect on social media using the hashtag ACSdata. For support, you can reach out to us at acso.users.support at census.gov. And if you end up using ACS data for any cool uh, education uses or otherwise, please make sure to source us. It helps people figure out where they can get the detailed information that we're giving you today. Um, you can also go on our website, census.gov slash ACS, and you can, um, you know, if you do end up doing something cool with our data, you can share your story with us, and we can help share your story with others and, you know, share how you used our data. So, all right. With um, with that in mind, I am going to um, I'm going to give the presentation back to Erlene. Sorry, back to Linda. Thank you, Erlene and Amanda, for presenting our audience with information on education statistics available from the Census Bureau and how to access the data. Thank you, everyone, for your interest in our data and for attending today's webinar. Before we begin our Q&A, if you have questions regarding the 2020 decennial census, please use the contact information provided here. We also listed information on our data dissemination specialist this is for anyone who may be interested in a hands-on in-person training. We have specialists assigned by geography that will be able to provide you with this service. And as a reminder, we're focusing our Q&A on today's topic, and we will be accepting questions regarding education data. If you have questions on other topics, please feel free to send an email to us at census.askdata at census.gov. And now we'd like to open the lines up for Q&A portion of this session. Operator, at this time, do we have questions in the queue? Not at this time, but as a reminder to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, Amanda, I wanted to let you know, thank you for including the palms in your presentation. We did receive a question regarding how to access raw data, so that was very helpful. We did have another question regarding to that, and it, it was related. It says, um, does the API support a variety of programming languages, languages for accessing the data? Would you be able to assist with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm still sharing my screen, so I can go ahead and um, if you go to census.gov slash ACS and you go to data, and go to POMS data. Um, we have two main ways of disseminating POMS data. We have um, the raw records that I showed you in the presentation, which are going to be on the left here, available on the FCC site. And this is where you, you select your year and then you select your data set. And then you will download that kind of raw data file. It'll be either in, you can choose to download it as a CSV or a Unix file, which you can load into it fast. Um, or you know something like that, um, and that will be the raw data file. If you would prefer to, you know, try your hand at our um, our microdata access tool um, on data.census.gov, you can click here, or you can, um, you know, go to data.census.gov and then scroll down to microdata, um, and that will take you to that will take you to where you need to go. And again, we did we did a demo on this. Um, on this tool on, in the PUMS webinar, um, which was a couple couple months ago on March 11th, and that is posted on Census Academy if you would like to see that demo. Thanks, Amanda. Let's check in with our operator. Operator, do we have questions at this time? Yes, we do. The first question comes from Ben. Your line is open. Hi. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, 
if there was any um, overlap or how the data that census has on educational uh, attainment um, might overlap with uh, data from the National Center for Educational uh, Statistics. And another question was, um, this would probably be in the longitudinal study, if there's any data that, that maybe tracks um, how associate degree um, or people that attain an associate degree, um, whether they might go on and then go on to like a bachelor's degree or other higher education, if there's any data that would, would point to that. Thank you. So this is Erlene. Um, that's a great question regarding the tracking of associate's degrees and going on to um, a bachelor's degree. All of our data usually comes from um, from employment data. So I'm I'm not sure about that, but if you Ben, if you send me an email, um, I can ask around the um, the researchers to see if they know where that comes from. Okay, great. And but I'm sorry, this this is this is Amanda. On the household side, we do have a um, we do have subject matter experts. Uh, we have an entire um, branch for. Um, education. It's called the Education and Social Stratification Branch. So um, you can feel free to reach out to us. I this, this is this uh, this has my my email rather than our support email on it. But if you want to reach out to our support email, it's ACSO for ACS so, um, American Community Survey Office. So ACSO dot users with an S at the end dot users dot support at census dot gov. And we can put you in touch with the subject matter experts because it's possible somebody did like a you know a report on that or something. Okay, great. Thank thank you guys uh, so much. And um, I guess if, if you had any idea that, on that general question that I asked about the National Center for Education Statistics and if there's like if they use you guys with an input maybe or or uh, or whether that's just separate data that maybe has some overlap in terms of what it shows. Um, that'd be a, qu a question we could put you in touch with the subject matter experts on as well. Um, Great. I, I know that I know that our subject matter experts work with other agencies either for you know if we we might we do reimbur reimbursable survey work for them or you know we work with them to get our coding list. Um, but we can we can look into that for you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It was a great uh, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. The next question we have is from Todd. The line is open. Todd? Okay. Um, we'll go to the next question. Next question comes from Tom. Your line is open. I think that might have been me. Um, my question is to what extent the particularly the employment data overlaps or complements the Labor Department statistics that they compile? Is that something you work with them on or is it something you do independently? Just a curiosity. Thank you. So Tom, um, we do work with the labor um, mar market statistics, but um, I feel that they get majority of their data from us uh, instead um, because we're we partner with them. So the data comes from the states, and then we um, create this data product, and then we share it with other other um, areas. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So Tom, this is Andy Haight. I'm an economist at the Census Bureau. Just to add one uh, small thing to what Erlene just, uh, just said, um, one major difference between the business employment data that we have at the Census Bureau and the business employment data that the Bureau of Labor Statistics produces is that we have a special program that Linda mentioned early at, at the beginning of the webinar uh, called non-employer statistics that covers self-employed people. Um, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, with very few exceptions, does not cover um, self-employed people. Um, there's over 24 million um, non-employer businesses in the United States, as opposed to about 8 million employer businesses. BLS covers the 8 million or so uh, employer businesses. Census covers both. So that's 
that is one difference that I usually refer people to uh, when they're trying to understand, you know, which which data set should they should they um, should they use. If they want to make sure they're counting folks who are in their communities that are self-employed truck drivers or a wide variety of other professions, um, including uh, folks, by the way, that work in the educational services sector, um, they should use the non-employer data. So that's just one addition I, I would make. Well, thank you. That That's a great clarification, having been self-employed myself for a couple of decades now. It's interesting to know that I've always wondered if the labor statistics included me or people like me, and that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The next question comes from Roy. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Um, quite a good uh, webinar. But I had a quick question. Uh, in the demographic um, um, that was mentioned, it depends, they're going to count where you live. Now, what is the time frame? Where you live or where you lived or what is it like? And the cutoff date or something? Because you're going to create a data on that, right? So it mentioned on that one line, which I remember still, it will depend where you live. Could you please elaborate on that? Right, yeah. So so on the, this is Amanda with the ACS. So um, on the ACS, the, the ACS specifically, which is what I presented on, it, uh, it's, it's a household survey. Um, so, like the uh, the educational attainment and occupation data I presented is um, based on is based on where you live. There are now there are some there is there is some commuting um, information in the ACS where you know we do ask you know how far do you live like like where we ask where you know where you work so we can calculate commuting data. Um, but again, that's the the ACS data is de is based on where people live, whereas some of the um, data that uh, that Erlene was presenting earlier um, on like programs such as you know uh, the PSEO data and stuff like that, that's based on where people work. So it 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 really just you know depends on um, what you're looking for. So is that answer your question? Right. Uh, yeah, it was partly, but the question is that you said that uh, it depends on where you live. As of what? As of a particular date or particular month or as of a survey date? Like, what would depend like? That's the question. What would depend and... It, it, well, the, the, I guess it doesn't depend on... It's, it, the data represents people where they live, you know, so... Uh, you know, I, I showed I showed you the data for Ann Arbor P Public School District. Um, the data that I showed you, the demographic data, will be will, will represent people that live in the Ann Arbor Public School District, not necessarily people who work in the Ann Arbor Public School District but live, you know, in another school district. So basically, that that's just saying the data represents people who live in that geographic area not necessarily people who work there but live elsewhere. Oh, okay. Okay, now I got it. Thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, answer. Thank you. The next question is from Rosie. Your line is open. Hi. Thank you again for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. One may have already been sort of answered, but I was wondering if there's any connection to the post-secondary, the PSEO study and the college scorecard data that's published by the Department of Education? So yes, there is. Um, that's all wrapped up into the PSEO. There is a webinar that we gave on March 18th, and um, let me give you the title of that. It's called Using National Jobs Data to Measure Graduate Impact. It's on our Census Academy um, website, and it's under webinars. So um, our researcher, Andrew Foote, gave a very explicit uh, or a very detailed um, webinar regarding the PSEO, and he does um, talk about the scorecard. So, Okay, thank you so much. And then just one other question about the PSEO in, um, specifically. What years is the data pulled from? Is it like one specific year? Is it 
an accumulation of 10, 15 years. Um, I've used the visualizer, but haven't really been able to figure that out. I, the, the data comes from 2001 to 2015. Okay. So um, if you want to send me an email of all your um, questions, Feel free to send me, you know, send me your questions. Um, but it is from 2001 to 2015. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. And again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. So there was a few questions that came in on the chat regarding uh, PSEO and also um, private sectors. So I wanted to just um, let people know that currently we do not have any private institutions in the um, data, um, mostly because we are trying to get um, more or try to expand the, by working with other states with higher education authorities. Um, so that generally has, um, they don't usually have private data. So it's costly for us to negotiate um, with private sectors because of the MOUs or, you know, the memorandums of uh, um, understanding. So um, that's the reason we don't have private institutions. And then there was also a question regarding citations. Um, we have certificates, and it just depends on what the um, universities send to us whether we, they have citations or not. So um, to just answer that question that came in on the chat. Thank you. The next question comes from Ted. Your line is open. wonder if this is me. Maybe not. It is there. Go ahead. Ah, okay. Uh, I was confused. It's Ed. But, okay, so a uh, couple, three things. Um, on Roy's, let me let me let me help you guys out or help him out. Um, I was part of a census bureau survey, and they ask you one of the first questions: Are do you still live at the house? And they give you the house number. Um, that's how they figure out your date of residence. So if you live at the house, you can continue on the survey. If you don't, if you've moved, if you no longer live in the house that they selected, then you are done with participation in that survey. So um, that's how that works. Um, so two questions. I was actually looking for this article. It was my question on the, on the citation. You keep talking about the University of Michigan uh, study or article or something. What I was trying to get is, is there a link to that thing um, or if you could provide information on their study that you guys keep quoting. The other thing sure. is... Um, I work for a higher education department, uh, a state higher education department, so I'd be interested in finding out how we can become involved in the post-secondary employment outcomes uh, project. Who do I talk to? Absolutely. Okay, so um, Ed, send me an email, um, and then I will refer you to Andrew Foote. He's the lead researcher for the PSEO. But... Um, the other question, the article is on our LEHD homepage under LED in action. And so, um, Amanda, you want to pass me the ball? Yeah, sure. Um, let me. Or and, and Lisa. Who is that you're speaking so I can send the email to the right person? It's Erlene. So okay. my email is E A R. L E N E dot K P dot D as in Delta O W E L L at census dot gov. Okay. All right. And so here is the home page. So it's L E H D dot C E S dot census dot gov. And Ed, can mm -hmm. you see my screen? Okay, then the last tab where it says LED in action, if you click on that, and then there's PSEO. Okay. And then there's um, uh, articles about PSEO, um, and then the one about the um, Michigan is at the top, so professional oh, okay. services, healthcare, top industries. 
Um, also, okay. when you're if you're on the PSEO, if you um, send any questions to the feedback um, where it says email us about uh, wanting to be a part of our, you know, one of our partners, you can just click on that and send an email and go straight to them. Okay. 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 Right. I'll, Thanks I'll for send the question. you an email and if you can send me some information, that'd be great. I'll talk to the powers that be and see if we can get involved with this. Yes, sir. That sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from Jerry. Your line is open. Hello. I was just wondering, the PowerPoint that you guys have been showing, the presentation, can can we have that sent to us or how can we access that? Because it has so many links and everything in it that I think would be helpful, you know, when I'm trying to explore all this. Yes. So that's going to be available on our Census Academy website. And is that the www.census.gov slash ACS? Wait, no. No, it's it's www.census.gov forward slash data forward slash academy okay. forward slash webinars. Okay. I, it's, it's actually in the chat box. Is it? Okay. All right. And one question. I am from a, a private college in Indiana, and you were saying, generally speaking, the data that you have is state or public school. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, but we still it still is very informational. So that's great. Thank you. And Indiana is coming out. Um, we are making um, some uh, arrangements with them. So parts of Indiana is coming out. Good. Good. Thank you. The next question is question is from either Lynn or Len. Your line is open, sir. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with the QCEW BLS uh, data and how it uh, correlates with the census data. So in the QCEW, particularly on the county level data, but also national and state, they have the super sectors and the super sector combines education and health care. Uh, it also has ownership breakdown. And, but it also has the NAICS category, 61, et cetera. So when, when I'm looking at super sector data on QCEW, uh, do I need to include the ownership uh, characteristics in order to map that into the census data? Uh, if that's a clear question, it's a little bit obscure, but. Andy, can you answer that question? Sure. So, um, so this is Andy Haight. Um, the, the, as you mentioned, the Bureau of Labor Statistics through the quarterly Census of Employment and Wages publishes data by industry um, and by ownership uh, characteristics. So whether that business is a corporation, a partnership, proprietorship, et cetera. Um, census similarly uh, does publish data by industry and by what we call legal force organization, LFO. Um, so there is a mapping between those two. Uh, most of the time when I talk to users um, about the comparisons between the BLS data um, and the Census Bureau's business employment data, um, and for that matter, our other data, number of establishments, payrolls, et cetera, the other data that are similar to what is published by BLS. Um, the, the two points of comparison that I typically bring up are, number one, uh, the comparison that I already mentioned earlier, which is that BLS does not count non-employers, uh, self-employed people, where we do. Um, they are not non-employers are not counted in the economic census. The economic census is, is a um, employer business um, program, but we do have data on them too. Um, the second uh, difference and, and the differentiation between BLS, QCW, and census has to do with how the NAICS code is assigned at BLS versus how it's assigned at the Census Bureau. Um, because we collect data not only on number of employees and payroll, but also on revenue and expenditures and inventories and assets and a variety of other statistics, we are able to classify a business into a NAICS code based upon what they report to us 
rather than having the business choose their own NAICS code for them, for themselves. Um, and in some sectors of the U.S. economy, that difference between self-classification versus the, the Census Bureau doing the classification, in some sectors, that difference is, is in, insignificant. It almost makes no difference. If you are a grocery store, you pretty much know what you are. Um, businesses don't think that all of a sudden I'm a gas station when they really are a grocery store. But in other very, very diversified industries and diversified businesses where at a single physical location a business could be doing multiple things, how that business is then classified then sometimes does vary. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at data for restaurants and data for bars in the BLS data versus the Census Bureau's data, you will often find uh, differences between our restaurant and bar data and their restaurant and bar data because often you have restaurants that have a bar in the restaurant and if the restaurant normally does the majority of the sales, that business gets classified as a restaurant. But if that restaurant happens to have a really good bar year and their food sales are lower than their bar sales, we would actually reclassify that business as a bar where BLS and the business itself probably would consider themselves, still consider themselves a restaurant because they think of themselves as a restaurant. Yeah, they had a great bar year, but they still are a restaurant. Um, it's it's very the, helpful. Real, the real part. So, but, so, so with, with regard to education then, if I want to look at the education employment through BLS's view, I, if I look at public education, do those numbers come under, um, uh, is education listed separately under, under uh, government education as far as uh, local, local and state education? And the numbers we saw today, would that have included both private as well as public education employment numbers? Right. So the differentiation between um, public education employment, ed, um, teachers that work for county school systems, that right. those workers and the workers that work for colleges and universities, private colleges and universities, that differentiation of the first type of, of employee is actually collected as a government. They are government employees. They are published in NAICS 92, um, whereas data for teachers of Syracuse University or, or any other uni private university, those are counted as NAICS 61, are counted in, in NAICS 61. That differenti uh, differentiation is the same between BLS and Census. Um, BLS does not count those, te those teachers any differently than we do. What they, what they would, though, count is, as Erlene mentioned, in the economic census, we exclude colleges and universities from the economic census data because the National Center for Education Statistics has data. They do their own survey on colleges and universities. BLS does actually include everything. So when you look at the NAICS 61 data for BLS, and you compare that to the NAICS 61 data from the economic census, you will notice a pretty substantial difference, and the majority of that difference is because we don't count private uh, colleges and university employees the way that they do, because they're, 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 they are one of those industries that are excluded from the economic census. Very good. So, so the data we saw in Michigan today, uh, Ann Arbor, that uh, presumably was all the public. That, that was not private. Uh, education numbers. Very good. That's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Linda. At this time, we are reaching our allotted time, and with respect for your time, we are going to accept one more question. Okay. The next question is from Michael. The line is open. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I think thanks. It was a great webinar. I just have really one question. And that is the uh, veteran employment. I mentioned about it uh, being a new uh, uh, site on your website. I wonder what data it is providing as far as employment for veterans. 
So this is Erlene. Um, so the Veterans Employment Outcome gives us data for enlisted Army um, military, and it gives us one year, five years, and 10 years after they are discharged and what jobs they have and what earnings they have. And it's just for enlisted employee, enlisted military, right? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So that's all I need, thank you. Thank you. At this moment, I'd like to express our thanks to everyone again for attending today's webinar. Please be sure to check out our webinar next month on economic geography. And this concludes today's presentation. Have a great day.